So this is a, uh, a presentation for, for a past finding paper on, on input output linkages, structural transformation and uh, uh, productivity. And uh, this is really motivated by, you know, what all of us is motivated uh, really is that we observe large income differences across uh, uh, countries and this is attributed to TFP differences. <coughs> And most of this result until recently uh, was based on, not all of them, but most of them on one sector models, uh, which abstracted uh, from several aspects of economic development. Uh, and some of those aspects we know about is that is there are large productivity level differences across sectors within countries. So you typically in poorer countries are larger one. This is uh, the agricultural productivity gap is one manifestation of those. Uh, then also the productivity growth, uh, uh, there's, there are also productivity growth differentials across sectors. We also know that the uh, output uh, growth volatility is also different and uh, the intensity of intermediate input use is also different across uh, uh, sectors. So, and, and there are also significant evidence that these sectoral differences change with the level of uh, uh, development. So, to what is behind all of this or potential, all of this, uh, 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 you know, there could be several factors that I'm gonna focus in this uh, discussion today is uh, on input output linkages and the potential implications for, for development. Now, let's say, let's start with the uh, um, multi-sector models as a starting po point, which uh, has been plentiful in, uh, actually in development much more than in macro. Uh, so starting with Louis uh, uh, paper in 54 and then several of them along, along the way, uh, th those are particularly about agriculture versus non-agriculture. But then I also found uh, an early work from Shannon Robinson and Strykin <coughs> from the World Bank, which is a whole book basically about uh, multi-sector uh, models and its application of uh, 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 development. Now, one crucial aspect, many of these uh, uh, papers that multi-sector models are set up as, uh, uh, you know, uh, producers of each sector, pro producers of value added. So, uh, and uh, <coughs> it has analytical, uh, uh, at, you know, convenience. But when we, all, when we look at the data, what we see is that actual sectors produce gross output from capital, labor, and intermediate input. And if one think about this one, immediately ask the question is how then we connect value of the production functions with the gross output production. And in addition to that, if we observe that there are uh, input output linkages between uh, sectors because one sector output used as input in other sector, then uh, those is, uh, linkages matter or not. Now let's start with the first question is the, how we connect value that production uh, with gross output production. Now in a, if we just have an aggregate economy, so there's no multi-sector and is that, that economy is closed, then uh, the answer is relatively easy because uh, all the intermediate inputs produced within a country are ultimately uh, with uh, capital and labor intermediate inputs. So uh, <clears throat> it's relatively easy to express uh, 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 the value of the production function uh, uh, at the aggregate level, uh, simply subtracting intermediate inputs from, uh, from a gross output. However, the issue becomes significantly more complicated once we have uh, multi-sector in the economy because uh, the intermediate inputs denoted here by ZI uh, from sec for, uh, uh, in sector I, it does not only come for sector I, but there's a bunch of intermediate inputs coming from other sectors. And uh, <clears throat> now in this case, when we write down the value of production function and uh, the value that is denoted by, by I, then uh, although accounting wise we can express the, uh, uh, the value added. The question is, does this FI exist at all? So we know that the GI does because that's what we observe, but the question is whether this FI, this production function, this value of the production function exists. And actually we do know 
uh, under what condition it does exist. And uh, there are cru two crucial conditions for that. One is that uh, the production function has to be separable in, from value added and, uh, and uh, intermediate inputs. The other is uh, uh, it has to be perfect competition. So effectively no distortions. Now, so in that context, for example, writing the models and then working with distortions in multi-sector model with value added production functions, it's somewhat questionable because the object of the exercise, namely studying wedges, is contradictory with the fact that sector value added production functions do exist. And the other issue is, of course, is whether this uh, value added part of the production function is separable for, uh, from uh, the intermediate input is, uh, you know, uh, it's not so obvious. So, so this is generally the issue around, uh, you know, how we actually think about uh, uh, sector level, uh, sector production functions. Uh, uh, and think about value added versus gross output production function. So from this first point, the conclusion is that perhaps it's safer to try to use actually uh, gross output production functions instead of uh, value added pro uh, production functions. The second question is, do input output linkages matter at all? So, uh, because if they don't, maybe we don't want to bother with gross output production function, even if that we, you know, may feel uncertain that we may, you know, violate some uh, technical principles, but, you know, it practically works then, you know. Now, <clears throat> so one is, is that perhaps it's not so uh, uh, obvious at first that uh, Assuming value at a production function basically or fundamentally assumes that uh, I can rewrite a gross output production function into value at a production function if the sector produces its own intermediate goods. So basically, there's no intersectoral linkages because then it's almost each sector is like the closed economy, so to speak. So having value at production functions is not a big, uh, big, big issue. So writing down value at production functions is kind of saying, well, I think uh, intermediate, this input output linkages do not matter. But at the same time, there's a whole, you know, series of thinking in economics that productivity growth comes from the division of labor across firms and sectors. And uh, this evolving, uh, ever more complex trade between different entities in the economy, that's actually a source of productivity growth. Think of the 12,000 suppliers for Airbus, which are not all in, uh, you know, air aircraft manufacturing industry, but comes from textile and all, so, uh, all sorts of different places. So in this context, I think it's, uh, it's safe to say that likely input output linkages matter even if we start formally studying them. And there are also technical issues, which I raised in point one about, you know, value added <coughs> uh, uh, production functions. Now, it has been argued actually before, a particular everyone quotes in this <laughs> literature, Hirschman 58 book on economic development, which I tried to source, but I didn't find because it's out of print for 20 years at least. And, in the library here in Manchester is not available and uh, COVID times makes it difficult to find books somehow. Anyway, so I'm just quoting it because everybody says that he said that. So, uh, but uh, more recent uh, 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 sources, uh, Chicona paper on, on uh, um, in the context of input output linkages and, and mm -hmm. economic uh, and productivity and so is Jones they actually demonstrate in relatively simple model that, that uh, actually distorting input markets in uh, intermediate input markets uh, makes a huge difference uh, in terms of uh, effect of on, so what extent is distortion effect uh, uh, productive, measured productivity in contrast if one just sets up a value added uh, 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 production function. So, so the overall conclusion for this kind of motivating part of, 
of my discussion is that there is good reason to think about input output linkages and what extent uh, they do uh, can they matter uh, for a lot of issues we talked during this uh, uh, today and also on the previous uh, workshops. So I'm, uh, the rest of my talks, I'm going to give an informal description of the input output models, which is basically the framework to studying uh, uh, input output linkages. And then I need to uh, actually get my hand a bit dirty with a formal, a bit more formal description of uh, uh, models. So in order that actually I can get to a expression for what, what can be used in development accounting, for example. And then I'm gonna present some cross country evidence on, uh, on, uh, on input output linkages. And uh, then I'm gonna discuss what input output linkages may matter for using, building on the existing uh, uh, literature. Okay, so informal uh, uh, introduction on this input output models for those who are not familiar with. So I have to confess, I always had affection to this type of models primarily because <clears throat> a long time ago when I, uh, when I started my life as professional economist in the, during the twilight of the centrally planning economists in Hungary, uh, I still studied this actually formally and probably it was one of the very few useful things that I, I learned there is uh, the this input output models. So basically, the whole idea is of input output models is is uh, is a build around the idea that in, there are intersector uh, transactions in the economy. Intersector transaction. This is what we call input output linkages. Sectors use products of the industries to produ produ produce their own products, but. Uh, <clears throat> and the outputs from on one industry back becomes inputs of the other. So this is what it is, what it is about. And let's just think about the car manufacturing. It uses steel, plastic, electronics, rubber, you know, the, the uh, uh, tires and textile for the carpets and so on uh, to basically to produce and all sorts of other things to produce, uh, produce the car. So rubber is, for example, the tire is a good example that uh, a tire is an intermediate input if, they, if Ford manufacturing buys it. But if you buy for your, your car, that's, then it's its final expenditure. Now, <clears throat> so this input output linkages gives a rise to uh, uh, to ripple effects so, or let's higher order effects. So when you buy a car, obviously it's gonna affect uh, the demand of steel, the electronics, the rubber and the textile uh, products, uh, which, is, which are used to produce cars. But since your car purchase affect all of these, uh, the production is all of these, the, the increasing demand for steel because you bought your car also gonna generate demand for electricity, iron ore, the change in demand for textiles gonna affect uh, the demand for cotton. So it's gonna be uh, a purchase of a car gonna have a chain, gonna trigger a chain of events through the economy uh, uh, from this, you know, following the supply chains from, uh, you know, from downstream uh, teams to, uh, uh, to upstream. And how big this effect is that you buy a car on the entirely cross output of the economy, it's usually measured uh, uh, with the multiplier and this tend to be uh, uh, larger than one if, if there are higher order, higher order effects. So now the, uh, analyzing input output uh, linkages is, you know, you actually you need to write down a model at, uh, at some point because uh, of uh, complication of how these various uh, 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 sectors interact. And there have been recent excellent surveys summarizing the literature on this on the, on the last uh, <clears throat> 10 years. And uh, before I, I get to the formal model, it is important to, to think about how actually this in, input output linkages may look like in principle, just informally. So for example, you can think of a horizontal economy when each sector produces its own intermediate input with capital and labor. And the final output is an aggregate of intermediate inputs. If you think about many macro models with intermediate inputs, basically that's what it is. 
a horizontal economy where basically there are no input output linkages because each, each sector produces its own intermediate goods and, and there's no interaction between uh, sector. Uh, now, the other possibility is kind of the polar opposite is a completely vertical economy where there's a uh, intermediate goods flow from the upstream sectors to the downstream sector unidirectional. It's just all the way down, downstream. Okay. And there's one interesting uh, possibility is that there's a star, uh, eco the star economy, where basically one sector or firm produces a vital intermediate input for everyone else. Now, this structure of the network, it is just solely the structure already actually affects the multiplier, which I mentioned before, the size of this ripple effect. In the horizontal economy, there's no ripple effect because there's no interaction between sector. So if it's uh, the demand increases for a final good, that's gonna affect just one sector, uh, it's gonna have no effect on the other sector. Now, in the vertical economy, on the other hand, is not, uh, not true. If it's uh, the increasing demand, uh, it's gonna generate kind of trickles down, uh, uh, downstream from, from, from upstream, it's gonna have a multiplier, effects is gonna be larger than one. Now, on the other hand, if there's one very important firm in the, in the economy, now if it's, something happens to that firm, uh, then it's going to have a lot, potentially large effect on the economy. So today, perhaps not, but let's say if 10 years ago, uh, Intel was su suddenly shut down all of its factories. I mean, that would have been a huge impact on uh, computer chip production, not just in the US, in the entire world. And it actually, as I remember like 10 years ago, uh, a big factory burned down. Uh, somewhere in, in Asia, and the price of the chips uh, skyrocketed uh, in the uh, you know coming months. So, if there are star firms or star or very important sectors, then actually they can any change in that sector can have a huge effect on the on the economy. So, and of course, there's going to be somewhere uh, star economy is one extreme, but it could be just hubs. Hubs basically that there are few sectors produce vital intermediate uh, goods to few others, and then those few others then perhaps produce uh, for, for the rest of the economy. And Intel today is perhaps a good example for that. Intel is not the sole producer of computer chips at the moment, but one of the few, and then uh, they deliver the, uh, the, for the producers. Okay, so this is roughly informally what input output linkages are, are, are about and why are they potentially important. And these uh, four examples are already different uh, description of potential network structures. Okay. So, <clears throat> okay, so let's have a simple model and it's all gonna be cup douglas. Uh, although the actual studying input output linkages, one, one can do it more, uh, more general. So we're gonna have N sectors and uh, uh, the gross output is denoted by Q. And uh, sector J, in addition to using capital and labor, uses intermediate inputs from all the N sectors. And this is all aggregated with the, with the Cup Douglas where the exponent uh, uh, add up to, to one, ensuring constant return. And A, that's the productivity of the gross output production function. So uh, the market for each uh, uh, good uh, J clears uh, uh, separately, obviously. Q is gross output. Uh, if I sum up the intermediate inputs, something is left, left in, the, in between this YJ, and this is something which goes to final sales, investment, consumption, government uh, uh, consumption potentially. Now, to keep the, uh, the model simple, uh, I just gonna assume that uh, we have a, a GDP and uh, uh, each of this final uh, output uh, is uh, just a constant share uh, uh, of uh, uh, GDP. So it's basically GDP is a Cobb Douglas aggregate of all of these final vectors, uh, the, all, the, all of these final uh, 
uses of uh, uh, good J. Okay, so uh, equilibrium with input output linkages. So I kept it very simple. That is, that I didn't really talk about preferences. I just closed down the demand with this uh, with this GDP. And uh, the, the big advantage of the uh, cup Douglas uh, uh, assumption is that I do know that the demand for each of these uh, zij uh, and current prices is simply a constant fraction of uh, the final uh, gross output uh, uh, qj at current prices. So that makes my life very easy because so, so on one hand, uh, uh, I have eliminated this PI, the, the, the price of each of this, uh, the, each of the different goods uh, uh, from my left hand side, right hand side, and I can simplify it, uh, stating only in terms of uh, quantities, uh, and I can also uh, write it in very well, relatively simply matrix form, namely that the uh, gross output uh, vector, this Q uh, uh, in time t equals one and the final output vector plus all the intermediate uh, uh, in, input uh, of each of these uh, uh, sectors, which then summarize in a vector. And the vector is this theta matrix, which is going to be crucial. Uh, which is summarizes uh, the input output uh, linkages in this economy. So, in sorry, Marco, just to, uh, to briefly interrupt, but we're, uh, if, if you could, uh, uh, given that we, we also want to allow time for discussion. Um, How many minutes I have? Well, you've now talked for about uh, 25 minutes. Okay, like, okay. Five to 10 minutes. Um, okay, uh, okay. Okay, so I bullshit it too much. So, what is uh, <coughs> okay? I, I try to speed up. So, uh, the advantage of the matrix form is that I wanted to uh, to get to uh, to this uh, uh, I minus capital C to uh, uh, to the power minus one matrix, which is called uh, uh, the Lewontjev inverse, uh, which sometimes. Uh, which basically summarizes uh, the input output linkages, uh, including the first and second order effects uh, in the economy. And the general interpretation is that 1% uh, 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 increase uh, in the output in the downstream sector J, uh, how much uh, uh, increase in output in upstream sector uh, uh, I is generated uh, by this 1% 1 percent increase. Now, the key equilibrium relationship, and this is what I wanted to get, is that once I have this uh, Lowenthal inverse, I can make some bold statements. So the one is that I can actually express the log of GDP as uh, uh, a weighted average of uh, the log uh, gross output TFPs plus obviously the contribution from capital, this is GDP per capita, and this lambda, which is the weight on the sector uh, 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 productivities, it is nothing else but the DOMA, so called famous DOMA weight. And it turns out the DOMA weight is simply a function of this Lowenthal inverse. Okay, so more besides the element of, uh, of this uh, uh, matrix uh, uh, together with the uh, share in GDP that determines together the, uh, uh, the domain rate. Now, the domain rate has been known, has been used, but this, uh, the, the input output uh, structure gives now a structural interpretation of uh, what the domain rates are in terms of the primitive of the, uh, uh, of the model. Okay, so let's have some stylized facts. I'm gonna have six graphs and four of them is kind of known, it has been done before. So one is, is a classic graph about how the horizontal axis we see the GDP per capita uh, uh, in PPP on the vertical axis, 
we see for 91 countries, including 11 sub-Saharan African countries, the intermediate uh, uh, input share in gross output in agriculture and on the right hand side in non-agriculture. So what we do see is that in agriculture, the intermediate input share is strongly increasing with the level of development. So the richer countries agriculture use uh, more intermediate input, but in non-agriculture, it, it is flat. Okay? So in contrast, if I look at just within uh, 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 agriculture, what I see is basically what I'm doing is I'm splitting this left-hand side graphs into two components, namely how much uh, 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 agriculture uses agriculture intermediate inputs, that's on the left-hand side graph, and basically there's no relation with GDP. And on the right-hand side, I see the uh, non-agricultural uh, sector, how the intermediate of the non-agricultural sectors in, inter in agriculture changes, and that increases with the level of man. Poor countries basically uh, don't Poor and rich countries buy the same amount uh, of intermediate inputs from agriculture in agriculture, but non-agriculture inputs are much more uh, uh, abundant in the rich countries than in the poor. Okay, so I do one more uh, uh, oh, oh. okay. So I do one more graph, then not five, uh, but six or five. So I also did the DOMA weights uh, uh, across uh, the level of development. And that is also shows there's a strong, uh, strong uh, uh, decline of agriculture, the DOMA rate of agriculture, which kind of makes sense uh, because we know that agriculture uh, declines with the level of development, or there's not uh, uh, necessarily uh, clear to how and how does it exactly happen as the as the country uh, uh, develops? More important, actually, I didn't find any such a relationship with any other with any in the seventeen other sectors. So basically, there is no. It's only agriculture that I see this uh, change. Okay, so uh, what uh, input output the teacher is good for? Let's say development accounting. I'm just basically without saying really. Uh, in detail. So it has been used, but only very few times. And the always conclusion was that it does matter, input output linkages. The problem with the existing studies, either theoretical, like John's paper, or uh, the data they've been restricted, they, they use were relatively limited. Typically, the word input output table is used, which have very, basically, there's no poor country in it, really. There are papers on contraction incomplete risk and volatility. Again, intermediate inputs all related to, to uh, you know, if you buy from some other industry, contracts are very likely to be incomplete. Uh, Kevin has a nice paper on how risk uh, is related to that. And we also have evidence that, that the volatility uh, uh, does uh, uh, depend on the uh, uh, input output linkages of the uh, economy. So more recent work on, on US data did find that actually there are few key hubs in the US which basically determine uh, the productivity growth. And obviously there was recently plenty of work how trade and input output linkages uh, uh, matter. Basically that's the way measuring uh, uh, global value chains. And uh, you know, papers do find strong uh, productivity growth in formal manufacturing in poorer countries, but no employment generation, which is the part in our paper. Okay, so what do we need to uh, for this approach? Data, 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 and I'm looking at Robert for data, data, data. And uh, okay, sorry for running late. Thank you. Um, that's uh, that's that, that's quite an agenda, um, not just uh, for Groningen, of course, but more in general, to make sure that we uh, can make sense of some of this. Um, who would like to um, uh, who would like to start a discussion? Uh, I, yes. Yes. Uh, I have a quick, a quick question, um, or a quick comment. 
The statement about the lack of um, value added production function that you do you refer to uh, that you require lack of frictions to be able to talk about that. Uh, the same applies for uh, when do you have uh, a, that we conjecture if it's true. When do you when do you have um, sectoral gross output value uh, uh, added production function? So, and, and I guess more generally is, is when you have distortions, one way to, to think about distortions is that then it will be a tough, tough a, a sectoral productivity, a TFP term, either the sectoral level, both at the value added production function or at this gross output sectoral production function, that will be a function of, of, of distortions. But I guess I will. Make that statement. And, uh, no, no, I've made a distinction about the existence of the production function, uh, although I know it's a semantic largely, and that we are able to characterize it. Because gross output production functions do exist, whether they are distortions or not. It just would be it's difficult to characterize. No, but if you have distortion within the, uh, the, the sector, say if the sector is, is imagine that, let's, say, let's, say, let's imagine that the, a sector is. Is, 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 is build up of firms. That is not as far, far crazy assumption. Then is there a distortion across those firms? So the, the same statement applies to the sectoral gross output production function. I mean, at least Bucky and Fari has a paper that actually characterizes even the elasticities in the presence of distortions. So one of the paper uh, from this trade, it's uh, misallocation and, and uh, uh, aggregate production function. Actually, it's about aggregate production function. That, so what they do there is you, you can characterize you. So, so the big difference is that, for example, this uh, development accounting equation, which I stated in, with, uh, with input output linkages, I couldn't do that in the presence of distortions because there are additional effects which you can characterize. I mean, that's um, what they show in this paper. Now, no one has a holy grail of ultimate truth, so. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah. So, um, I was just trying to think of this, this last, uh, slide data 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 in thinking about developing countries and I guess maybe even connecting with Paco's question I guess the ideal data set we would have firm to firm transactions at you know at the firm level a firm level input output matrix um, how much can you do with less I mean, I mean and that data doesn't exist obviously but how much can you do with less data if we just think of like a, a three sector model in the input output matrices for three sectors, are those data gonna be more available? Uh, and maybe this is also a question for Robert, are those data gonna be more available and how informative would those be? Because the pictures you were showing were like agriculture, non-agriculture. Um, I, just, I just showed because, okay, so the data I used, uh, I got it from Groningen, uh, uh, from St uh, uh, Stefan Pahl who worked, has paper on uh, with Timur, this is 91 countries with 19 uh, uh, sectors uh, and this is a good data except since the data was used for global value chains the service sector is not really well integrated into it at least not for all countries but the manufacturing construction uh, uh, mining and agriculture yes i just focused on on uh, on agriculture in this particular case so uh, I think in, it's, this is something Robert perhaps uh, uh, can answer better, but I think this kind of 90 some countries with a, with a set of sub-Saharan African countries uh, with this sort of uh, 20 something sectors, I think that, that could, would, I think that would be informative. I guess I, I, the question, we have the 10 sector database we all know. Is, yeah. is it possible to uh, include a wider set of countries with a three sector database, for example, or a two sector, whatever it is. And would that be informative at all? I guess that's kind of yeah. what I was trying to want. Well, in the, 
say, let me make two, two short points. So the first would be that if we're talking about the sector database, uh, the, the most difficult issue is employment. And that's, that's a constraint uh, in terms of how much uh, that needs most time investments. Uh, second is that there is a lot of input output material uh, out there um, and uh, yeah, there's there's many many institutes like uh, it's, it's integrated in GTAP uh, and Maggie can also uh, speak to some of the, the the other sources that are out there uh, and that's indeed what uh, what Stefan has also used and uh, and that they, we within the scope of this project uh, we can certainly uh, um, build on what is already there. Um, so I think that I think there is certainly scope for expanding what we have available and what we can do. Um, uh, in particular, uh, as so as Akos has in his list, his input output panel data I, uh, that was on my slides as well. Uh, gross output productivity levels at PVP. Uh, and we're also going to strive to have time series of those to um, to get to to really work on some of these issues um, so that's that's on our agenda and we, we welcome uh, input we welcome uh, collaborations on that um, and, 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 and yes more can be done than has been done so far Doug Doug. Yeah, so first of all, really just fascinating, Akos, and um, great to see this laid out so clearly. I'm, I'm just thinking of really interesting intersections here with, for instance, some of the firm friction work that we heard about the other day in, in different STEG workshop and thinking ahead to spatial frictions that in a sense, and, and thinking also, I don't know if Kemu is still on the call, but thinking of some of his work on how frictions in these input output linkages accumulate and the connections here to things that we actually can measure with some confidence in, in developing country contexts, in, in particular spatial frictions, um, seems like there's potential put, to put together both theory and empirics that could really make a huge contribution to our understanding of, of what's going on. And it just seems like there's a great research agenda here. So that's just to well, encourage not only what you're saying, but to make connections to some of the other STEG yeah. themes where I think there's a lot of overlap potentially. Thank you. All right. Hi. Uh, yeah. Sorry, this is uh, Kamu. Just in response yeah. to uh, sure. Doug's in. Uh, in response to Doug's uh, point, I agree with uh, what he said. And uh, I mean, if you look at the trade literature now, uh, most of the work, in the, most of the frontier work in trade now is actually not really about international trade. It's about spatial frictions within countries and how that's affecting the allocation of uh, resources and the location of firms and households, uh, et cetera. And that hasn't really been applied to a structural change context. And I think that would be interesting. I also wanted to just briefly follow up on Joe, uh, Joe's uh, question about what you can get out of a more limited uh, data set. And uh, I think you can get a lot. Of, and one example is this uh, recent paper by Michael Sposi in the JME, where he showed that uh, you know, these evolving, he documented these evolving input uh, output uh, linkages, even in the simple three by three case uh, as countries develop. And in particular, as countries develop, the reliance, of course, on services as intermediate inputs uh, increases uh, for, for the production of all three broad categories. And he does a counterfactual that shows that, uh, you know, three quarters of the hump in industrial value added is basically due to uh, these differences in the input output linkages uh, as countries uh, develop. So, um, uh, so, I, so just to summarize, I think you can get a lot uh, out of understanding the importance of input output linkages, even from a more coarse database, but which, you know, allows a broader inclusion of countries. Thank, thanks. Thanks. 
Um, on the chat, uh, a question by Ryan on how some of these patterns that you showed uh, on input-output linkages in agriculture would matter for productivity. Uh, well, <clears throat> so there was, so, so, the, so the question was, uh, or, or is, uh, um, so what's the effect of uh, input-output linkages on the estimated uh, size of agricultural productivity levels? I think the, the question is not that, I mean, the, the, if data is consistent, it, there should, um, there could be some difference because of this moving between gross output and value added, but that's not necessarily a, a big one. With, with input-output tables, on the other hand, you can pinpoint uh, which are the potential uh, sectors which contribute to largest extent to the low agricultural productivity. So if various intermediate inputs are very expensive and that's why uh, uh, agriculture buys relatively little of them, then with the input output linkages, you can identify what are those uh, uh, sectors. So I think that's, that's one. But there, there was one, one graph which, because I was working on the last minute, so I mixed things up. So, so I had a graph which uh, measures what uh, it's, co it's called the degree of agriculture, a weighted out degree of agriculture. Basically, how much ag actual agriculture contributes uh, uh, to every other uh, sectors in the economy. And it turned out, which kind of surprised me, that in poorer countries, actual agriculture contributes also to other sectors in intermediate inputs. And then, as obviously, but less surprising as economy develops, that, that disappears. So overall, lower productivity in, in, the, in poor countries could also come partially, at least, from the, the buying intermediate inputs for, from a low productivity sector, namely agriculture. Um, thank you all, and uh, have a good day. Thanks. Bye.